I'm very pleased today to welcome Dr. Jan Lowe back to Cornell. And uh, Jan is the principal scientist with the International Potato Center, SIF, which is based in Nairobi. Uh, she's also the 76th graduate student of our uh, longtime uh, late colleague, Professor Dan Sisler. Uh, during the past decade, Jan has managed the Sweet Potato Action for Security and Health project in Africa, Sasha, and co-led the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health initiative. The latter was a multi-partner, multi-donor initiative that reached 6.8 million African households in 15 target countries with improved varieties of sweet potato and promoting their diversified use. Dr. Lowe obtained her doctorate in agricultural economics at Cornell, minoring in nutrition. Having worked over 25 years in sub-Saharan Africa, she's focused with her team on developing and promoting biofortified orange flesh sweet potato to combat vitamin A deficiency. In 2016, along with two SIP colleagues and a colleague from Harvest Plus, she was awarded the World Food Prize for work on biofortification. Please join me in welcoming Jan Lo today. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be back at Cornell, and I always love coming back here in the fall, the spring, and the summer. And I avoid the winter like the plague, uh, for obvious reasons. Huh? Um, today I want to talk to you uh, in general terms about some perspectives I have on whether a boy fortified crop like orange flesh sweet potato can meaningfully contribute to food system transformation. I think uh, we all, uh, many of us in this room, are aware that the food system uh, is really being examined closely and evaluated uh, these days because it's a very complex food system that we've built up over the years. And there's increasing agreement that this system is broken. And agriculture has a major part, obviously, in the food system. And people are concerned that we will need to be feeding 9.6 billion people by 2050, which means that we do have to increase the amount of food calories available in the system. Um, but there's an increasing recognition that uh, the way in which we produce food needs to meaningfully change to be more sustainable. And this is due to the high levels of fresh water that is used by uh, agriculture the pollution of water, and our co the contribution of the ag system to greenhouse gases, and associated loss of biodiversity, especially when forests and wetlands are cleared. Can everybody hear with this mask? I'm trying to speak up a little bit. Yeah. Also, I don't know if we can get rid of the things on the top there, but I guess we can't. It's sort of blocking the. Uh, the title of the slide, uh, but growingly there's an increasing recognition, even in sub-Saharan African countries where most of my work has been focused, that we have a triple burden of malnutrition to deal with. And that's in the sense that not only do we have the problem of undernourishment, but we have also the issues, uh, uh, it's not coming up the issues associated with micronutrient malnutrition, which is guesstimated to affect about 2 billion people, and a growing problem of overweight. Uh, so we are moving from the perspective that we worked on for many years of food security um, towards a more we need to be nourishing people and moving towards more quality diets. Ah, now it's working. She performed magic. So again, um, Really, over more than half of African countries now have the tri triple burden problem. And uh, so increasingly, attention is being paid to look at the performance of the food system, both in rural and urban areas, 
where the overweight problem is more severe. I always love to give this example of a, the case of Indomie as an example of how food systems in Africa are being transformed very quickly over the past two decades. And Indomie, I'm sure how many graduate students here live on ramen noodles? Fess up, fess up. Uh, how many people have ramen noodles every day? And the equivalent Indomie instant noodles came into Nigeria in 1988, and it's become, it's touted as a great business success. Um, when it started, there was basically no noodle consumption. The first factory was built in 1995. Now there are 10 factories and 17 other companies in Nigeria making noodles. As most of you probably know, a quarter of the continent's population is in Nigeria, so it's a huge market. And what's concerning from the nutritional point of view is, let's face it, noodles are basically starch. Not a lot of micronutrients in these noodles, and they add fat and sodium and flavorings to make the different flavors of the noodles. And if you look at it, it's relatively cheap, 17 cents equivalent per packet. But if you put that on a kilogram basis, it becomes $2.49. But more disturbing even is the fact that this is being targeted to children. If you drive down the roads in urban and rural areas of Nigeria, primary schools are printed with Indomie advertisements and this is a healthy food for you, tasty and healthy and nutritious. And even it's the only brand of noodles that's gotten the endorsement of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria. So we can see how ultra-processed foods are moving into markets where people traditionally have relied on roots and tubers and grain staples and uh, their traditional fruits and vegetables. And this is a, just an example of the kind of transformation we are seeing all over the world. But targeting children, and that's the greatest concern. But I do think we also have to look on the positive side and there's an interesting study that's recently come out in Global Food Security that really said until looking at the period from 1990 to 2017, where we have seen progress, at least up until 2000, through 2017, in significant decline in the impacts of chronic hunger and hidden hunger, or micronutrient malnutrition if we measure it in terms of the health burden. And they're doing that by looking at the dailies, the disability uh, life years saved. And in this study they found, you can see in the first graph above, that between 1990 and 2017, the total burden of chronic hunger reduced by 72%, while the total burden of hidden hunger declined by 41%. So really, we have to acknowledge that there has been uh, great progress made, at least until the pandemic, in tackling some of the major problems of hunger. But of course, as we can see in the second and the third graph, uh, comparing across regions, Sub-Saharan Africa is the region suffering the most from the burden of chronic hunger, while in terms of total numbers, in terms of millions of dailies, uh, the highest burden of hidden hunger is in South Asia. If we looked at that differently on a per capita basis, Sub-Saharan Africa would be worse on these indicators, uh, both in hidden hunger and chronic hunger. And in their further analysis, they found that the import and production of cereals and the supply of vegetables, including pulses and fruits, matter in the alleviation of both of these forms of malnutrition. Part of the issues that revolve around looking at uh, the, how we're going to move forward and what we should be focusing on as we look at the food system issue is the expected impact of climate change on crop production. And this presents many challenges to the production systems in different environments. But I think one of the most intriguing areas has to do with what will be the overall impact of rises in temperature, 
and of course the accompanying increases in carbon dioxide levels. And these two things, obviously temperature really often affects crops in, in many places negatively when it gets above 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, the, it speeds up crop development in some places and also for the cereals reduces grain numbers and size. But the overall effect depends on the carbon pathway used by that plant to photosynthesize. And we expect to see in these modeling exercises and these experiments that have been run in CO, with using CO2 chambers that those that use the carbon-4 pathway of photosynthesis will see an overall approximate 8% yield loss by 2050. That includes maize, sugarcane, sorghum, and millet. And actually with the C3 plants, the temperature effect will be balanced off by being positively affected in terms of yields uh, going up. And that's right, wheat, potatoes, sweet potatoes, soybeans, beans, and peas as an example. And then you have the last category of plants that will have the least positive response to CO2 increase, the pineapple and cacti. But what happens with this reaction, yields will go up, but it will go into carbohydrate production. So for those of us very concerned with micronutrient malnutrition, there's an expectation according to these experiments that nutrient density in C3 plants will likely decline. And these experiments have been run for zinc and iron and protein, and they've seen drops in rice, uh, peas, soybeans, sweet potatoes, and wheat a dilution effect in terms of nutrient density. So in that sense, paying attention to the micronutrient status of our crops is of utmost importance in the context of climate change. Again, another inling modeling exercise said, what would that mean in terms of disease burden on the global uh, world? Uh, in terms of if we had this effect on iron and zinc, two very critical micronutrients. And you can see the per capita burden of disease uh, due to these nutrient declines would be highest in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and selected countries in South America. So when we look at our food chains, and we really understand uh, we can work very effectively to improve uh, the nutritional value of the food system by taking more advantage of the vast diversity of plant species that are available to us. Out of the 30,000 edible plant species, only 150 are cultivated. So there's a lot we aren't utilizing to their full extent. And six are dominant in terms of providing global calories, and particularly maize, rice, wheat, sugarcane, soybeans, and palm oil, and half of global calories are estimated to come from rice, wheat, and maize. And therefore, not surprisingly, research has focused on these crops since they have been critical, and as we can see, have positively contributed to the reduction of some of that chronic hunger problem. But Certain studies have also come out saying by not paying enough attention to the micronutrient content of some of these plants, including vegetables, that we have seen an overall decline in the nutrient composition of these plants over time by the focus that has often been on yield increase. And so again, going back with the extra burden of climate change, uh, there is a real call for paying more attention to the nutritional quality of the plants that we are utilizing. Also, to improve the food system, a lot of the things that are most nutrient enriched uh, are also most perishable. And that calls for more investment. Clearly, there's calls out for more investment in cold storage and other ways of doing this. But I can tell you, living in East Africa, the high cost of electricity and its unreliabilities have made investment in cold storage often not profitable. So we are hoping that with the continuing decline in renewable sources of energy that we may be able to reverse 
uh, some of these constraints that have plagued us in, in these kinds of efforts to improve the post-harvest system. In addition, we have uh, information coming out very strongly, looking more closely at prices of food and different kinds of food, and what would it take to get us to an affordable, healthy diet. And this study that came out by Herforth and all uh, last year has gotten a lot of traction and basically given us some new information and benchmarks to build on where they estimate that the cost of a healthy diet is almost five times more than an energy sufficient diet. But realistically, again, the energy sufficient diet is the first area. Even getting to nutrient adequacy would cost on average 2.33 USD, which even nutrient adequate diets are not achievable by 1.5 billion people. So we have a ways to go to make nutrient enriched food uh, more affordable and get that diversified diet. And again, not surprisingly, the problem is most concentrated in Sub Saharan Africa and South Asia. Now, biofortification. Are many in this room uh, familiar with the concept of biofortification? Can we raise our hands? Oh, that's good. All right. For those of you who aren't, I'll give a little brief background. Um, the, it's a process of increasing the density of vitamins and minerals in a food crop through conventional plant breeding, genetic engineering, or agronomic process. Now, that, that meaning usually in fertilizers or fo foliar sprays. In the efforts that I have been engaged with, we've been really focusing on the conventional breeding approaches. And we've been focused on three major micronutrients, vitamin A, iron, and zinc, because of their importance and the effects of not having those in the diet, and on staple food crops. And the focus on the staple foods, in, in part, is driven by the fact that poor people, particularly in real, rural areas, get over 50% of their calories from staple foods, and often that comes with a significant number of micronutrients as well from those staples. For example, uh, Hadi Buas put together some evidence from the Philippines from a 2015 study. And you can see here um, the poorest quintile in this population, which is a heavily rice-dominated economy, got 86% of their energy from energy-given foods. But even when you move up to the richest quantile, 68% are still getting 68% uh, 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 of their energy needs from the energy giving foods. Although that composition of those foods changes, there's a lot of rice still in the diet. And you can see alongside here that for the poorest, 52% of their iron, 71% of their thiamine, and 42% of their riboflavin, requirements were also coming from rice. And we see overall in diets that dietary quality improves with income, but that improvement can be gradual and takes time. Clearly, animal products are very rich bioavailable sources of micronutrients, but often the level of consumption is low in many low income and uh, medium income countries because of the cost. So if I need to outline for you why we are focused in our work at the International Potato Center on the orange slash sweet potato. And there are many reasons for this, but you can see from the diagram here that I always like to say that no part of the sweet potato plant goes to waste. Um, both the roots and the vines can be utilized. The vines as human Seed, the leaves are a great source of lutein, which also prevents macular degeneration. The orange flesh roots, of course, are an excellent source of beta carotene, which the body converts into vitamin A, and just one small root meets the daily needs, vitamin A needs of a young child. 
But also sweet potato roots have sources, or are good sources of many other vitamins, C, K, and E, and several B vitamins. Um, but most importantly are the flexible harvests and planting times of the crop. It can fit into a variety of farming systems and can grow from sea level to 2,400 meters in the tropics. And it has the highest energy output per unit time, per unit area of the major food crop. And importantly, in the context of climate change, it is more water use efficient than most grain crops except for millet. It also is an extremely important animal feed in East Africa in particular. It's used by the dairy industry, the vines in particular, because they are high in protein compared to napier grass. So if you chop them up and serve them fresh 50-50 with napier grass, your milk production will go up 20%. So clearly, we have a cycle here. And most smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa do not use uh, inorganic fertilizers. So getting access to that organic manure to put back in the fields is part of the cycle. So we had a long struggle to get this crop prioritized. And you think it would be a natural one. But in a sense, sweet potato had always been seen as a woman's crop and a poor person's crop. So we had an image problem. Sweet potato is known as the crop that is there when the maize fails. right? So if you're getting better off or your goal is to move beyond and uh, have uh, sweet potato is associated with times of trouble. So it's changing the image from being a crop of the poor to a healthy food for all classes of society was one of our major goals. Then the other big challenge that cassava faces, as well as sweet potato and other vegetatively propagated crops, is it's very easy, which is a positive, for farmers to retain and share the seed. But that means that private sector seed companies are not really interested in getting into uh, the distribution and multiplication of these crops, which implies a strong role being needed from the public sector. And I would say until around 2010, I think there was a lack of sufficient global recognition of the importance of nutrition and the potential contribution of the agricultural sector to improving overall nutrition. And now we have movements like the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, which is now in 61 countries. And there's a high prioritization in many of those countries of what we call nut nutrition-sensitive agriculture. We have worked a lot on an integrated approach. It's not enough just to hand out the orange slice sweet potato, but developing community-based nutrition components to go alongside the intervention as part of our impact pathway for really making a difference to young child nutrition. And over the past two decades, that in, uh, intervention model has been refined over time. And we've worked very closely with uh, the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University since 2010. And I just want to mention a model that we've been using uh, that has proved very successful in SNNPR Ethiopia. It's our Healthy Living Club model. And we have eight monthly sessions. And in each of these community sessions, we train the government extension, community health uh, extension worker and build in a series of community volunteers to go out. And each volunteer is working with uh, 30 uh, households. And we've learned over time that it's very important to have both the men as well as the women attend these sessions as a household. And at the end of each session, after the introductory session, sessions two for eight, each couple sits together and decides among the various practices and talked about and discussed in the session which one of these they will focus on to truly implement before the next session. And in the next session, they report on what they've been able to accomplish or the problems that they encountered. So this is called a goal card. And we found this goal card is a 
very good way to stimulate discussions within the household about what practices to try and adopt as a household. Oops. There we go. In addition, we're very pleased to have worked with Emory on field testing and validating in a randomly controlled trial the use of the Healthy Baby Toolkit. Often when we work in community-based interventions, we aren't really giving much guidance to the household in terms for the young child in terms of the amount and quantity of enhanced porridges that should be uh, provided to the child. And the Healthy Baby Toolkit it really is a graduated bowl that indicates the portion size and frequency of giving the enhanced porridges uh, to the young child at different ages, the six to nine month old group, the nine to 11 month old group, and the 12 to 24 month old group. And also has a line to indicate enhanced intake for the pregnant woman. The slotted spoon indicates uh, really that the porridge should be thick enough to not fall through the spoon. Because I think we have all seen the very thin, non-dense porridges, often just of maize, or cassava that are given to young children. And they aren't sufficiently energy dense to have the good growth. So we see the orange flesh sweet potato as an entry point to talking about better nutrition, but obviously we talk about the broad range of nutritious foods available in the community. And certainly in this kind of healthy living club intervention, additional crops can be added to the portfolio being promoted. Demand creation and advocacy, because most of the sweet potatoes traditionally grown in sub-Saharan Africa are white fleshed, the orange is a change. It's a visible trait. And uh, we really had to launch alongside the introduction of the orange fleshed sweet potato, uh, what we call a demand creation activity to associate the orange color with good health. It's actually a very fun campaign to be involved in. Orange trucks, painting of uh, market stalls, and various other activities to have orange being associated with foods of good health, particularly the orange slice sweet potato. We identified influencers within countries and trained people on how to be advocates so we could get internal change in policies within key target countries we were working in. And most importantly, in order to be able to reach large numbers of beneficiaries, we had to work with many partners. And to do so, we had to uh, really improve the quality of training on good practices for sweet potato and the use of that. And we developed a 13-module course called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sweet Potato and worked with local institutions in different countries so that they could become the implementers of that course. And now we have those modules available online in five different major languages of the region. So as mentioned uh, during my introduction, under this initiative, taking what we've learned from our delivery system research, We've been able to reach 6.8 million households by 2021 in the target countries shown on the map. There's still a lot more to do, but progress is being made. And I think really what it took to make it all happen was the strong investment we had, thanks to our donors, in breeding in Africa for Africa. Um, if you just take a sweet potato from the United States over to the African continent, it will die when exposed to the viruses that are different and stronger, particularly in East Africa. And moreover, it has a very considered watery texture. The children love it because it's easy to swallow. But in most African countries, adults prefer mealy sweet potatoes, much higher in dry matter content. And that required cycles of breeding. And we had, um, adopted and implemented an accelerated breeding scheme. So we reduced the time of breeding from eight to 10 years to four to five years to get new varieties out. 
And critically, there was a key investment, along with AGRA, in training 10 PhD level and four master's level sweet potato breeders. Because basically, there were hardly any sweet potato breeders on the continent. So getting that critical mass and investing in breeding meant we got varieties uh, that where the orange beta carotene rich trait was bred in to adapted local materials that had the taste preferences and the ability to withstand the abiotic and biotic stresses. So every generation of varietal output, we get better. And since 2009, 76 better adapted orange flesh sweet potato varieties that met consumer preferences have been released by 13 national programs. We are starting to get funding to be able to see the impact of the work over time. As you know, impact assessment, uh, you have to have the distribution, and then you don't want to go in at the end of the project, but wait at least two years or so to go in and evaluate true adoption levels. Recently, in 2019, data co were collected for a study in Malawi. And we looked at project participants and found those who had been targeted in a project, 66% we're still growing the orange flesh sweet potato at least two years after introduction. 46% of those in the same village but who were non-participants were growing sweet potato. And 31% of the counterfactuals in villages where the orange flesh sweet potato was not promoted or introduced were also growing. So you see the informal sharing that happens with these vegetatively propagated crops. The average yield we found by crop cuts was 11.5 tons per hectare. Malawi is a rain-fed uh, agricultural system, fairly poor degraded soils. So that's good output for that con those conditions. And we did find that market penetration was not as good as we would have liked it to be. Uh, we only found in the 41 markets surveyed, 17 where it was being sold. So most of the orange flesh sweet potato is being consumed in the home in this, these conditions in Malawi. And the variety, Kajabwerere, we, again, we did varietal identification when we were doing the assessment. And Kajabwerere was the variety among the six that was the most popular. Increasingly, we have been focusing on the other very important pillar of the integrated intervention, and that is market development. Having markets for the crop really helps us sustain the adoption levels and accelerates adoption, as you can imagine. Urban consumers want foods that are convenient and affordable. So our focus has been really on products that where we can substitute 30 to 60% of wheat flour using the orange flesh sweet potato puree shown in the picture. And this is steamed and mashed sweet potato. And we've developed methodologies where the skin is retained. The roots are carefully washed, but the skin is retained. So really, the loss of weight in the processing is reduced to less than 2%. And the skin actually means there's higher dietary fiber and actually more iron and zinc in the final puree product. The bread has become commercialized with 35% replacement of wheat flour with the orange flesh sweet potato puree. And the japatis are proving quite popular as well. And because it's a flat bread, we can go up to 55% replacement. Juices are another possibility. The best combination has been 85% sweet potato and 15% fruit juice as the most popular with consumers. Again, fresh marketing of sweet potato can be uh, also promoted and is promoted and getting people to taste the new varieties and learn that not all orange flesh sweet potatoes are the same, that there's distinct varieties, helps in this regard. So a clear emphasis on getting people to recognize different varieties and their quality. So given this, what are the key challenges that we are seeing? that we need to address to be able to really exploit the full potential of vitamin A sweet potato to have its potential to contribute to food system transformation realized. 
And I'm going to go over five briefly. The first challenge I think we are increasingly facing, facing is what I call the either-or mentality. There's limited resources out there. There's a lot of competition for those resources, as all you fundraisers will know. And right now, people are debating, you know, what's the best investment? Industrial fortification, biofortification, diet diversity, supplementation. All these efforts work at getting micronutrient uh, to needy target populations. And in the graph here, uh, this is a graph looking at various cost-effectiveness studies of different micronutrient interventions. And you can see that the cost-effectiveness varies. You know, the ones on the left side are more cost-effective versus the ones on the right side. But of course, it varies by location, what is being used, and your target population and how hard they are to reach. And my feeling is, it is a combination of strategies that will give us the best results. Supplementation is really important for addressing severe cases and can be very effective in the first year of life when people are attending antenatal care and young child services. But of course, it usually requires donors to ensure that those supplements are there over time. Biofortification's great benefit is really targeting rural areas and we has the big advantage of we're addressing the chronic hunger problem together with the hidden hunger problem. And one of the problems with these cost effective analyses is you're usually evaluating the dailies based on the micronutrient impact. But of course, with a crop, there's many other benefits in terms of income generation, energy supply, and other varieties other kinds of micronutrients that not, might not be in your daily evaluation, but that are contributing to a better diet. Industrial fortification works very well, particularly in, in industrial settings and urban populations, but does require, if you don't have the regulators there and the oversight, you can have a product marketed as fortified, but then when it's actually analyzed, the level of fortificant isn't what it's supposed to be. So it does have that particular quality to it. And of course, diet diversity is the ultimate goal. But you'll see on this chart that kitchen gardens and those kinds of interventions are the most expensive because you require a lot of behavioral change, different seed systems, knowledge management. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't mean we should never do them. It's just recognizing that it's going to be more costly to get those changes. Uh, on a per capita basis. Mainstreaming nutritional traits. Some of you may know the uh, system that I work in, the, the one CGAR, is undergoing a major reform now to bring more of us together under a unified management structure. So this is a time that has me a little worried in the sense that there's going to be resources um, put into breeding. Breeding's a major component of what the 1CGI is committed to in terms of uh, crop development. But you can see this is just for the sweet potato. There's a long list of traits that we breed for. This is just a partial list, right? And of course, it varies a little by agroecological environment. But yields and sizes of roots and type of growth and ability to sprout after the dry season. Increasingly, drought tolerance, water use efficiency, heat tolerance, in some areas, salinity tolerance is important. Of course, maturity period. We've been breeding a lot for early maturing varieties, in part for drought avoidance. You have the pest and abiotic uh, constraints breeding, weevil resistance, virus resistance. And then, you know, our standard quality traits, uh, looking at dry matter and texture and cooking time, and of course, trying to pay more attention to gender differences and preferences on all of these traits. So the CGIR is trying to develop a more uh, unified breeding strategy based on product profiles. And the emphasis, 
um, it has been put really on emphasizing market demand and looking at what are the dominant varieties in the system and how do we breed to replace that dominant variety. Uh, probably more uh, comprehensive uh, targeting and selection procedures, you know, looking for the, a variety that will do well across multiple environments. So that is the competitive environment for the limited resources. And here's the challenge we face. If you're interested in the nutritional traits, they have to be added to this long list. And mainstreaming to me means it's in all your major breeding lines. And to be honest, with Harvest Plus and the work we're doing in various institutions, you know, I, the breeding for biofortified traits has tended to be in a separate line. And in part, this is driven by cost because it takes, in a given breeding program, it costs us about 150,000 to 180,000 additional dollars a year to do the high put, throughput screening and evaluation for traits that are involved in this process. For example, for our vitamin A work, obviously we have a big advantage because beta carotene content is associated with the intensity of the orange color, right? So we can do some preliminary selection just on that. But of course, we're interested in all those other things I was talking about, texture, um, the dry matter content. So we use the near-infrared spectrometer shown here uh, to process the observational trials and get that first cut on material that moves forward in the system. So we're heavily reliant on the NEARs. And that costs $5.27 a sample right now. But you say, that's not very expensive. But remember, in an observational trial, we might have 20,000 clones. So let's say we throw out 30% because they don't meet the basic orange color criteria. But still, that's a lot of money when you start multiplying that by 10,000. For the minerals, it's even more of a challenge. Again. They have to use a more precise machine, the X-ray fluorescence spectrometer for screening. But after you do that screening process, then you have to take a select subsample and send it for to the ICP machine because we have to confirm that that iron we're seeing in the sample is not due to soil contamination. So you have to look at the full spectrum to be able to rule out the fact that your iron might be false results. So again, you can see the challenge of mainstreaming into all the major breeding lines. It's a cost challenge that I'm concerned about because mainstreaming is the key to having nutrition as a major component in our breeding programs as we move forward. Then the classic seed system bottleneck. In essence, that now we're breeding much, much faster, even conventionally. But the challenge is how do we get them out to the farmers at the rate we're breeding the improved materials? And as I mentioned before, with vegetatively propagated crops, but also with self-pollinated crops and open-pollinated crops, the level of interest in the private sector is low. Hybrids, obviously, you have to go back and buy them every year. So what does that imply? We've spent a lot of time developing and training uh, networks of decentralized vine multipliers. And we've learned over time that as a business, they have to become vine root enterprises. Because the demand for vines varies by year. It's really high when there's a new variety and people want access to that new variety. But once they have it, if they can retain it well and multiply it themselves, they aren't coming back for repeat sales. So really, the vine multiplier has to have a specialized vine multiplication area, but also be a root producer. So any vines not sold go into his or her root production system to make it economically viable over time. So it's a challenge, and a lot of work has been done on trying to better understand and work on root and tuber systems because they're so unique. And the Roots, Tubers, and Banana Consortium Research Project 
has loaded up a number of excellent tools under the Seed System Toolbox that people can draw on and utilize in their programs. For us, a major breakthrough is a very simple technology that we've worked through for our most vulnerable farmers. And these are our farmers in drought-prone areas. And we've developed a technology or a method called Triple S, storage in sand and sprouting, that basically uses roots as the source of seed for the next season. And at harvest time, we take the smaller but healthy weevil-free roots and store them in layers of sand in a bucket or local container. And that way, they don't have to be trying to keep their planting material alive uh, unt until the next planting season in these areas where water is a major constraint. And then six to eight weeks before the rain starts, uh, they plant out in a nursery bed these materials and multiply them and have a, lots of planting material, about 40 cuttings per root when the rain starts. And this has been really a breakthrough technology, a knowledge-based technology for the poorest households in drought-prone areas. Challenge number four, and I don't know how this one is going to go. We really need healthier soils to underpin sustained production cropping systems. Everybody recognizes this, and this is the hardest area to raise research money for because it takes time to produce the results. And I think the work of Ratan Law has emphasized how improving uh, soil health can help us sequester carbon into soil organic and inorganic matter and inorganic carbon stocks and contribute to the reduction of agriculture's impact on the environment. However, if you look at a lot of the documentation about trying to bring these practices into play, there are a lot of constraints. And particularly, the no-till practice, for instance, they found very low adoption. And this is mostly for the grain crops among smallholders. Because that crop residue that you would use for mulching is also animal feed. So you're competing for different uses. There's a lack of seed drills. Oftentimes, these techniques require use of herbicides, which may not be affordable. So I think this is an area where a number of high uh, organized interventions with it's going to require considerable subsidization and labor support is going to be critical if we're going to really start turning the oil, soil health situation around in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa where the soils are already degraded. Challenge number five, I think we know when we go out, we really focus on conventional breeding because there's been such strong resistance to ge genetically engineered crops on the continent. But the reality is that there can be a lot done through genetic engineering to really increase the multiple micronutrient content of many plants and get us to higher levels of iron and zinc. I think maybe many of you are familiar with the long story of golden rice. You know, getting that from con concept into the field has been a difficult process. There has been some movement lately in terms of uh, BT cotton being approved in some countries and BT cowpea. But clearly, this is a barrier, I think, for being able to invest in modern technologies uh, to address climate change issues as well as our nutrient deficiencies. And it's affecting the future generation. I was talking to a professor we've collaborated with a lot at Joma Kenyatta University, and he basically says his biotech program is dying because no students want to take it because there aren't jobs when they finish. So it is having significant impact in our training for the future. <coughs> So wrapping up the way forward, I think it is exciting. That a lot of the ideas that came out on the consultative process for the UN World Food Summit that was held, uh, that ended in September this year. If you look at the number of commitments from different organizations in these five action areas, 
There were over 231 commitments made, and many of these were in coalitions. Because of the advocacy efforts, biofortification has already been well integrated into ag and nutrition policies in 24 countries globally. But um, during the, uh, many of the country presentations, and certainly by the African Union, it was mentioned as one of their key strategies for looking at nourishing all people better in the future. So some concluding thoughts. Again, of course, I'm totally biased and admit it. <laughs> I think the ultimate goal is to have more affordable, healthier diets grown in a sustainable manner. And I think we need to look at investment and promotion of nutrient-enriched crops as a package where biofortified crops can be promoted together with our legumes, vegetables, and fruits. We need to move away from either or and think of it as joint because with staple foods, we're going to be able to lower the cost of those staple foods, meet some nutrient adequacy needs, and open up income for people to be able to grow and purchase other nutrient-rich foods. Sustainable production systems is going to require a massive public sector investment. I don't see any other way around it, and there has to be a global commitment and a national commitment to making that investment especially for soil health. And I would just conclude by reiterating that orange flesh sweet potato is in a sort of special position because it can be considered a field crop as it's looked at in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa or as a vegetable crop, both for the roots and the leaves. And then its ability to grow in a wide variety of environments, its efficient water use, its high energy output per unit time per unit area, its strong micronutrient content across a range of nutrients, but particularly beta carotene, uh, is a real plus for moving forward. So I think I may have gone a little over time, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan, for your important work and for being here to share the insights from that work with all of us. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes for a couple, two or three questions. So uh, raise your hand. Those that have to head off to another class, uh, uh, feel free to do so. Those who can stay, you know, the uh, floor is open for questions. And I'll let you call on people. Yes, and please tell me your name as well. Oh, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, I'm curious whether uh, 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 people in these regions are aware of the micronutrient benefits of sweet potato, or are they just well, when we start and, and do an intervention, it varies by country. If there has been a strong promotion of vitamin A supplementation, often people have heard of the vitamin A concept. In other countries, we really have to go in and describe what do we mean by micronutrients. And that can be a challenge. Um, it, in many cases, the, the typical approach might be to break it down into major food groups and talk more about protective foods and stay away from the detailed discussion of a particular micronutrient. But in our approach, we really try to inform people about what vitamin A is and what its impact is on your immune system to build a strong immune system and on eye health. So our approach has been to really address vitamin A and then talk about the broader range of micronutrients in the context of protective foods to ensure good health and good young child growth. Next question here. Yes. Hi, I'm Adele. I wanted to ask, uh, you touched briefly on the ET crops at the end of the presentation, um, but also talked earlier in the presentation about sharing of crops between farmers and uh, among local communities. And I kind of wanted to ask about the how those two might be at odds with each other. There's a, an interest in having uh, GMOs available because there is great nutrient potential in that, but also there is this idea of you can't share, you can't, uh, you have to continue your purchase and things like that among uh, genetically engineered uh, products. Yeah, I think, I think it depends on the kind of product that's been developed and whether it's a patented product and a hybrid seed, which is, you know, has a, a license and a contract with a private sector seed company. 
We work in an area where it's more a vegetatively propagated crops. And actually, a sweet potato is clonally propagated. So really, there's no way you could really put a patent and control on that. It would be extremely difficult. You might be able to pay a royalty for some pre-basic seed coming out of a centralized unit. But I always say one of the great things about doing field research on sweet potato and varietal testing is once you put a test out there, actually the variety's out there. And uh, we've had examples with uh, Irish potato in Kenya where a variety that got rejected by the breeders ended up being a dominant variety. The breeders didn't take it, but once it's out in a trial, you know, anybody can steal a vegetatively propagated crop and it's going. So there's, you know, I think that in that sense, in the context we work in, once you're out of the hybrid seed realm, um, I think that need to, uh, it's, it's, it's a plus and a, a negative. It's a plus in terms of farmers have control over these materials, but it does make it more of a challenge getting widespread distribution because you need to support that distribution with funds. And if the public sector isn't strong, that means you have to raise those funds. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Oh, Ed, sorry. You're... Okay, sure. My name is Gaurav Mogri. I've been working on plant biochemistry. So uh, one question I had was, what are your thoughts on uh, purple plastic potatoes in the context of Africa? So pur purple plastic Oh, yes. I'd love to go into purple flesh. Yes. You know, it's very interesting with the purple flesh sweet potatoes. Uh, uh, Maria Andrade, my fellow uh, laureate and the breeder in Mozambique, has released five purple flesh sweet potato varieties in Mozambique. We have one that's been released in Ghana now. It's interesting because people love the texture. It's a yam-like texture. So we're finding really high acceptance, particularly in West Africa. Um, and so we're very excited for the purple flesh sweet potato. Now, purple flesh sweet potatoes are full of anthocyanins, which are also antioxidants and important for good health. I would say beta carotene is number one in terms of health impact. But after the purple, uh, orange comes the purple. And of course, we know in China, uh, which is the dominant sweet potato growing country in the world, purple fleshed is loved. And they do all sorts of products with the purple fleshed sweet potato. So we see great potential for the purple fleshed as well. In the future. Yeah. Um, so my name is David. I just have a question. As you alluded to, in some countries in sub-Saharan West Africa, Philippines as well, the leaves are just as important, if not more important, than the, than the tuber. Um, so I'm curious, for specialty producers of orange flesh sweet potato, have you seen an impact on how they emphasize components of yield in sweet potato? Like if the emphasis on the orange flesh sweet potato negatively affects uh, leaf yield for home consumption or vice versa. Well, you know, the, uh, the consumption as leaves as a human food really varies by country. So when we work in a country like Zambia, you cannot release a variety that doesn't have good leaves because leaf consumption is so important, for example, in that country. So we do actually, during our varietal testing, we do leaf trials and have people consume the leaves and eat the leaves. Um, and, and we do measure foliage. And in, because in our drought-prone countries, our unimodal areas, vine vigor is one of our, one of our uh, observational variables that's very important for it, indicative of survivability of the crop across the dry season. So we pay a lot of attention to vines and multiplication rates. Because we found the multipliers are key in the value chain. And if a variety multiplies too slowly, it drops out. Because the vine multipliers want varieties that have good, high multiplication rates. So again, this is something that's evolved over the past decade. In the beginning, we weren't paying much attention, to be honest. Enough attention to the vines. And then we've learned over time that they're critical components not only for their nutritional value, but the whole planting material system depends on vine productivity and vine resilience. 
and also the ability of the root to sprout again at the end of the dry season in unimodal systems. Just the last one. Yeah, thank you. Yes, you uh, Given that orators uh, are generally back and uh, the infrastructural, especially all the infrastructural limitations in the countries they're working in, have we considered that this could be having an effect on the scale of production and the market competitiveness of the products we are making out of the sectors? I'm sorry, I didn't get the first part of that question. I'm saying uh, potatoes are generally bulky. Yes, they're bulky, yes. And uh, they are, the transport network or infrastructure is not that developed in the countries we're exactly. working in. Have uh, we considered that this could be the challenge as to why it's not grown in large scale and why the value-added products are maybe relatively expensive compared to wheat products? Okay, all right. So the sweet potato, you're absolutely right. It's a bulky food, so long transport distances can raise cost. Um, so it really, you see major uses. For example, if you go to Kampala in Uganda, the sweet potato growing area is near the city. So again, the sweet potato in that city is much, much cheaper than in a city like Nairobi, where the major growing area is seven hours away. So it does influence, the transport cost does influence of the overall cost of the sweet potato root. Uh, we have done quite a bit of work trying to improve the transport system in terms of how people manage the harvesting and post-harvest management of the sweet potato. But really, the, really, to get those improvements, you have to have really strong, consistent market demand. So it's, it's a complicated thing to do. We did spend uh, four years, um, I'm, I'm big on trying to develop uh, solar powered cold storage for sweet potato. Uh, it's still a pipe dream. I'm about to try another project with it. Uh, our initial effort in, in terms of that, where we, given the, still the relatively high cost of the renewables and the management issues, we weren't able to get to the break even price for four months of storage yet. But we are learning along the way. So part of this is a process. Um, but the key thing is to raise the value of the crop in consumers' minds. If the consumers want the crop, it will get there. Um, and because we're investing more in water technologies, you're increasingly seeing sweet potato move into semi-arid areas that have irrigation. And with irrigation, we can get 35 tons per hectare. And then you can really serve some of these towns in these more drought-prone areas. So there's a number of strategies we can use to reduce that distance between markets that have high demand for the sweet potato and the source of production. Yes? Thank you. Please join me in making sure. Thank you all. Very good. So yeah. Oh, the chicken.